So who is, who is actually, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, move please. Next slide, yeah. This is a 39 year old, he's a captain of a ship. And he presented to me with a subacute onset head tremor, unsteadiness of gait with slurring of speech for six months. There was no behavior or cognitive decline in that patient, but he gave a very strong history of alcohol consumption. He was um, taking alcohol for 17 years and he has the history of excessive drinking for the last four years. He claimed it was 16 units of alcohol daily, but I guess it was far more than that. And he stopped drinking four months ago. There was no family history of ataxia. So for a patient who has that kind of alcohol abuse and it comes with unsteady gait, the obvious diagnosis that we usually make is an alcohol-induced cerebellar ataxia. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we actually um, performed a clinical examination on him. And what we found that he has got cerebellar dysarthria, that means scanning speech. And there was a tremulousness of head, which is also known as titubation. His higher functions and affect were normal. I, uh, I will show you the video in a minute, but the eye uh, movements was full, but there were slow saccadic breaks in the eye movement, and there was horizontal gaze evoke nystagmus. There was finger nose ataxia, there was stancing gait ataxia, and on top of it, when he was walking, the entire trunk and limbs became dystonic, and he exhibited coriform movement of left outstretched hand. Fundoscopy was normal. And next, uh, go to the next slide, please. On both sides, can you um, show the video again? Can you show the video again, please? Dystonic limbs. Uh, next slide, please. Now, start. <laughs> There is no ophthalmoparesis. saw on this video, you can see the eye movements were full, but the pursuit eye movement was broken up into small saccades. That's what they say. And there was a little bit of fine nystagmus when I was looking to the sides. And you could have seen that there was some finger nose ataxia, there's titubation, and there was a typical cerebellar scanning speech that he had. Right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when you think that there's an alcohol-induced ataxia, there is a classical finding on the MRI scan. We do the mammillary body imaging. And the mammillary body imaging, we see the atrophy symmetrically of both-sided mammillary bodies, and there is some hyperintense signals in it. There is a very classic sign of cerebellar ataxia, which is alcohol-induced. But here you can see very clearly that the mammillary bodies were symmetric, and without atrophy and without hyperintensity. So what could be our clinical diagnosis? Now this patient presented with dystonic features of limbs with coriform movements along with the cerebellar ataxia. 
Another very important thing that can happen. Can I go? Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, some other diagnosis. Now you can see here in the MRI scan in the thalamus. I think the cursor of my laptop is visible. You can see there is a symmetric hyperintensity of the posterior medial part of the thalamus. And it is uh, found in both T2 and Freire images. Next slide. Now, this is a very, very interesting picture. You can see a very classical hyperintense signal in the midbrain MRI. And this, um, I will uh, discuss about this particular type of signals in the brain a little bit later. Next slide. We did the biochemical investigation, the full blood count, glucose, urea, creatinine, everything were normal, vitamin B12, thyroid. The serum ceruloplasmin and 24-hour urinary copper, which is a very important kind of cause in this sort of uh, phenotype. These were normal. We um, examined for K ring on slit lamp examination, and that was negative. So Wilson's disease is very high on the card according to the patient's phenotype. The patient has what dystonia, the coriform movement, along with there is a cerebellar type of ataxia. So I would have expected these results, these biochemical results to be abnormal. And this would be clearly a Wilson's disease, but that was not there in this case. We did a genetic analysis for some of the scar which is available and they are all turned out to be negative. Next slide. Now, there is a saying, face of a giant panda. How does it look like, the face of a giant panda? You see, a panda has got black ears, has got black eyes, and the peri, uh, the region, the peripheral region around the eye is also black. This is the little black nub that is the nose. And the rest of the face, the panda is white. Now, if you see that midbrain MRI here, the substantia nigra, were black and the red nuclei are black. These are the ears and these are the eyes of the panda. And the aqueductal region is black. And the rest of the midbrain are white or hyperintense signals in the T2-weighted scan. So these are very typical phase of giant panda appearance, which is classical of Wilson's disease. One can see a small panda in the pontine region. We can see double panda, both Midbrain, but this is the most classical image of Wilson's disease. So the phenotypically, the patient is Wilson's. Radiologically, the patient is Wilson's. But biochemically, we didn't get 24-hour elevated urine copper. We didn't get deficiency of ceruloplasmin or KF ring. So next slide, please. So is this a Wilson's disease mimic? Or is it Wilson's disease with normal biochemistry? The only way we can really uh, diagnose Wilson's disease if you do a genetic analysis. And if you do, there is a mutation in that affected gene, what we call ATB7 uh, mutation that you see in Wilson's disease. So, but, uh, uh, well, we didn't do the genetic analysis and uh, on this patient. So I would expect comments or questions from those who are pan in the panel. Uh, or you can write in the chat box and then we can come to that. Let's go to, uh, let us go to our next case. All right, case two, proceed. He's a 59 year old man who has insidiously progressive unsteadiness for four years. And he also complained that he is having frequent loose motion for the last one year. Right, next slide. Uh, upon examination was found to be alert, well-oriented. The general survey examination was normal. The cranials were normal. The fundi were normal in both eyes. There was no nystagmus. Motor and sensory long track signs were normal, but he had stance and gait ataxia and there was mild appendicular ataxia. The other system examinations were normal. Next slide. Now we did the investigation, the routine investigation, X-ray, 
ferritin level, vitamin B12, uh, the causes that uh, Dr. Gautam Guha said that we have to look for in a case of cerebellar ataxia. So all this turned out to be normal. He also um, said that another thing, if you make a suspicion, if you strongly suspect in the case where there is a diarrhea, you do a serum tissue transglutaminase IgA. And that was also normal. So what should we do in this patient? This patient has got insidiously progressive cerebellar ataxia for four years. With, and for the last one year, he was having chronic diarrhea. So we proceeded further. Next slide. We uh, went for the genetic analysis negative. The cerebellar MRI was entirely normal. So we did a colonoscopy. The colonic diverticuli are there, that there was polyps in the sigmoid colon, which are rather innocuous, it is benign. So we went on further to do a double lumen, double balloon enteroscopy. The double balloon enteroscopy showed multiple shallow ulcers in the ileum. Next slide. And you can see here, the multiple shallow ulcers in the ileum, in the jejunum and in the ileum. Next slide. We did a histopathological biopsy of the ileal specimen, and this showed focal villus atrophy and chronic inflammation consistent with celiac disease. Next slide. Next slide. And you can see here the villi were atrophied. You see here the villi is normal, and here these are blunted. And there were inflammatory cells all around, which is very classical of celiac disease. And Dr. Guha has said celiac disease has to be suspected in a case where it's a diarrhea. And if that is there, this is one of the treatable causes of cerebellar ataxia. Next slide. So we started the patient on strict gluten-restricted diet. His diarrhea improved. And there was, uh, I mean, after six months, there were significant improvement of cerebellar ataxia. Next slide. So it was one of those very rare cases, gluten-sensitive cerebellar ataxia. We'll go to the third case. Uh, sir, next. before we uh, go to the next case, uh, so there are a few queries I would ask. Uh, Please you. share. So what is the, Dr. Monica and Dr. Anupama Sen, they are asking what is the most common age of ataxia? Most common age of ataxia? Well, it depends. I mean, there are a lot of ataxias which occur in childhood. If a person has cerebral palsy, individual has cerebral palsy, he'll, he may get cerebellar type of cerebral ataxia, which is, uh, I mean, um, cerebellar type of cerebral palsy, which can happen in children. If a person is in the mid or uh, late childhood, one can have ataxia telangiectasia. You can see the telangiectic spots. So it depends on what age you are seeing. Before the age of 25, if you think about genetic ataxia, Friedrich's ataxia, is uh, quite common and should be ruled out. In the third and fourth decade of life, you see the scars, the genetic ataxia, um, the scars are present, the various types of scars are, I mean, uh, they actually present at that sort of age. Then there are tumors, when there are late age with tumors present, present with ataxia. So the ataxia can come at any age and the diagnosis, I mean, the, depending on what is the cause, underlying cause for that axiom. So that is the same question by Dr. Sunita Pai. She wants to know more about ataxia definition, the clinical signs and treatment. Ataxia means it's imbalance, right? If the patient has unsteadiness in his gait, he's called ataxia. If he has unsteadiness in the limb movement, that is also ataxia. So appendicular ataxia, if they have unsteadiness in the limb movement, which is demonstrated through finger nose test or through heel shin test, if the patient has uh, stance and gait unsteadiness, we call it stance and gait ataxia. Ataxia can be from various causes. It can be cerebellar disease or it can, uh, if there is a, the joint position senses, are absent in the legs because of neuropathy. One can get sensory ataxia from there. Then there are other ra rarer causes of ataxia. One can get um, spinal ataxia. The spinal disease sometimes gives rise to ataxia because the posterior 
column is involved. Ataxia, the loose term of ataxia is unsteadiness. Okay. Right? Right, sir. So, uh, Dr. Saurabh wants to know oculomotor apraxia, masquerading as ataxia, and lighten on the clinical markers and differentiation from ataxia. What is oculomotor apraxia? This is very, uh, um, David Kogan is one of the uh, very famous neuroophthalmologists from the US. He coined the term oculomotor apraxia. Oculo I mean, you have to have a video to show oculomotor apraxia. When you sort of ask the person to look from one side, the person cannot uh, normally move uh, his eyes to one side. What they do, they do a looping. They sort of blink and look. And that's how the eye, they force the eye to move two sides. These are called oculomotor apraxia. There is a term called ocular ataxia. And what is that term? If a person can see an object, but when he tries to grab the object, he cannot. His hand goes elsewhere because he cannot see the depth of his, uh, that the image, he cannot guess or gauge the depth where the particular uh, image is. So that is a term called ocular ataxia. There is a disease um, where one can have disease of the um, posterior uh, part of the parietal lobes where they can have this sort of ocular ataxia or oculomotor apraxia. So these are the terms which is best uh, uh, sort of uh, seen when we see the picture. So are there any clinical markers for that, Dr. Tapas? Clinical marker for oculomotor apraxia? Yeah. Of course, I mean, if you see, these are the movement disorders. If you see a video of that, I can show you how this particular oculomotor, it's a clinical diagnosis, oculomotor apraxia or ocular ataxia. Okay. Right, so Dr. Rajender Kushawa wants to know COVID-19 diseases treatment therapy with without ventilation. Why this has come here? This is not relevant to the present uh, particular... Maybe in ataxia, COVID-19 patients uh, regarding COVID-19 patients for ataxia? I cannot give rise to ataxia. I mean, if you see a neurological manifestations of COVID, one can get... Guillain-Barre syndrome from COVID and can get sensory ataxia, if you want to say that. Um, COVID-19 rarely gives rise to encephalitis. Let me tell you that. It can give rise to encephalopathy due to umpteen number of reasons. One can have uh, hypoxia. One can have um, dyselectrolytemia and other uh, sort of uh, drug-induced problems. And all these uh, things can give rise to encephalopathy with which means where the patient's sensorium is very much impaired, but direct encephalitis, where there's inflammation of the brain related to COVID-19 is extremely rare. And, you know, ataxia from that is again, uh, I guess it's extremely rare entity if it is at all there. Guillain-Barre is occasionally, there are, okay, there are very few cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome related to COVID-19, but Guillain-Barre syndrome can give rise to ataxia. It's a sensory type of ataxia. Right? Anything else? Shall I proceed and finish up my third case and then we can have a lot of time to answer questions. Uh, this is a 22 year old man who presented with erythematous cutaneous rash with mild fever. And a few days later, he developed acute onset blurring of vision and unsteadiness of gait. And I will show you the video. Next slide. Mm -hmm. 
Right. What you can see there is morbilliform, a missile-like rash on the skin. You had fever. And after that, can you um, show the video again? You see the eye movements are multidirectional, very chaotic and jerky movements, and appears whenever he looks from one side to another, they're multidirectional, sudden, very jerky movements. I'll show the video once again. Play the video again. Play the video, please. <laughs> Right, uh, next slide, please. So this is called opsoclonus. This is a rare type of eye movement disorder called opsoclonus. And uh, along with opsoclonus, I couldn't give you the other videos. The patient has got cerebellar dysarthria. His speech was a scanning speech, cerebellar type. And he had stance and gait ataxia and finger nose ataxia as well. There was no long track sensory or motor deficit. Other examinations were normal. Next slide. We um, uh, did some uh, routine blood work and they were normal. The MRI was normal. Next slide. Uh, we gave him clonazepam and he made recovery in two months' time and he fully recovered in two months. Next slide. Now, this is a diagnosis. We call it post infectious. After viral infection, they get opsoclonus, this type of funny eye movement with cerebellar ataxia. It is a rare disease, but it, uh, these are encountered in uh, neurology clinics. And these patients, they do recover. So post-viral cerebellitis that Dr. Gautam Guha said is this uh, same kind of post-viral cerebellitis, which give rise to ataxia. And there was these funny eye movements along with it. It's called opsoclonus.